Well, first, we should really restrict this to South America. Uh, Central America was uh, essentially crushed by uh, Reaganite terrorism, and it will be a long time before Central America revives and recovers, if it ever does. Uh, but it's true that from, and the same is true of a good part of the Caribbean, uh, but uh, from Venezuela down to Argentina, uh, there have been uh, uh, substantial changes. It's not, uh, I think we can even extend the time scale beyond uh, the quote that you gave. Now, this is actually the first time since the Spanish conquests, so that's over 500 years, that uh, two forms of integration are beginning to take place in Latin America. One is uh, steps towards integration among the countries of the region. They've been very disconnected with one another, uh, tied to the whatever imperial power it was that they were linked to recent years, mostly the United States. Uh, but there's another kind of uh, uh, integration that's taking place. These countries are also very sharply divided uh, between a small, uh, very wealthy, uh, Europeanized, mostly white elite, and a great mass of uh, deeply impoverished uh, people, uh, uh, Indian, black, uh, mestizo, the race lines aren't precise, but they're pretty well correlated. So in effect, it's been a small Europeanized elite connected to Europe or to the United States. That's where they export the capital. That's where they have their second homes and so on and so forth. That's where their cultural roots are. And a great mass of uh, impoverished, uh, oppressed people uh, who uh, have uh, lived about the worst inequality in the world. Uh, and uh, uh, the elites themselves have been disconnected from one another. Now, both kinds of integration are beginning to take place. It's been going on for quite a few years. Uh, the mass popular movements, like the Bandless Workers Movement in Brazil, uh, goes back over 20 years. The uh, union movements, uh, militant union movements, out of which uh, Lula da Silva came, uh, also go back to the, uh, to the 80, early 80s. Uh, the Indian movements, which are now, finally entering the center of the stage in Bolivia and Peru and uh, Ecuador, they've had uh, the roots, uh, efforts going back quite far, but it's beginning to coalesce. And it is leading to a degree of integration in both respects. That is challenging the uh, very harsh uh, disparities and oppression uh, internal of the societies, and also beginning to uh, link them to one another to a greater extent. It's a halting movement, uh, but it's visible. So, for example, um, in early December in uh, the Cochabamba, there was a, in the place is symbolic, this is the center of uh, Indian resistance in Bolivia for a long time. Uh, the, uh, in Cochabamba, there was a meeting of all the Latin American leaders, South American leaders, uh, constructive meeting, uh, they began to discuss uh, plans leading potentially towards a kind of European Union federation, if it develops that far, uh, towards expanding the Mercosur trade bloc. Uh, there had been some conflicts among the Latin American leaders, in particular between uh, Chavez and uh, Garcia in Peru. They were apparently patched up. Uh, there was talk of uh, what's called what Chavez calls the Bolivarian alternative for the Americas, an integrated uh, Americas, separated, uh, free from the dominance of the United States. The sort of symbolic conflict there is between ALBA, the Bol Bolivarian alternative, and uh, what is called the free trade area of the Americas, meaning a US-dominated uh, trading area on neoliberal lines. And uh, the, this conflict takes various forms, but it's continuing. Uh, the uh, two traditional means by which the United States has controlled Latin America are both uh, weakening, both because of developments internal to Latin America, which have been going on for a long time, uh, and events in the international arena. 
uh, one of those means has simply been violence. So for years, the U.S. has routinely uh, overthrown uh, social democratic governments, uh, more or less progressive governments, uh, uh, installed vicious, brutal dictatorships. I don't have to run through the record, but it's been going on for half a century, uh, in fact, far longer. Uh, that method has lost its efficacy. The last time that the U.S. tried to overthrow a government by violence uh, was in 2002, uh, when the United States supported a military coup that briefly overthrew the government of Venezuela. Uh, and uh, it was shaking up into the ordinary coup. The, the new announced uh, you know, Cabello took over. Pedro Carmona immediately uh, dismantled Parliament, uh, dismantled the Supreme Court, uh, uh, Attorney General's Office, Public Defender, uh, every vestige of uh, democratic functioning in the country was immediately dis dismantled. And it was therefore hailed in the United States and most of Europe as a democratic uh, coup and a triumph of democracy that's normal. Uh, but it was uh, the U.S. had to back off, uh, both because of internal developments. The, there was an internal uprising which restored the original government. And because there was a lot of protest from Latin America, where democracy is taken more seriously than it is in the United States or in the West. Uh, and in the face of that, the U.S. backed off now pretends it had nothing to do with it, uh, and had turned instead to subversion, extensive subversion, to try to undermine the government instead of military action. Well, that's the most recent effort at a military coup of the kind that used to be routine. Uh, the other method of major method of control has been uh, economic strangulation. The neoliberal economic rules are effectively designed to allow strangulation of the country by economic means. Uh, through the IMF and so on. Well, that's weakened too. Uh, the countries of the region have individually and collectively moved to, uh, borrow the phrase of the Argentine President Kirchner, to rid ourselves of the IMF. The Argentina, which was the uh, poster child of the IMF, its most marvelous achievement, uh, economy completely crashed, worst disaster in its history. Uh, it has recovered, but by radically violating IMF rules as a normal mode of recovery. The IMF is a branch of the U.S. Treasury Department, in effect. Uh, the, uh, they restructured their debt, refused to pay a lot of it. A lot of the debt was bought by, uh, about a third of it was bought by Venezuela to assist them. Uh, and they ended up uh, kicking out the IMF, so no more IMF rules or controls in Argentina. In a different way, Brazil had done the same, uh, probably the same. This will happen in Bolivia, where again, Venezuela will help uh, uh, purchasing the debt. The debt, I should say, is completely legitimate. Uh, this just has no legitimacy whatsoever, even in terms of uh, traditional capitalist uh, conceptions, certainly uh, uh, in terms of the legitimacy of who borrowed it and who who has to pay for it. But they are getting rid of the debt, which uh, and, and the controls of the IMF, which means that the econo economic controls are declining. Uh, furthermore, these are very, this should be an extremely rich area. Uh, it's tremendous resources as compared to East Asia, if you far greater resources and opportunities for development, but if you look at the level of development, it's been totally different. But the reason is Latin America has been, has not had independence has not been able to undertake independent development. East Asia did. So East Asia always disregarded IMF rules and neoliberal principles and was therefore able to develop. Uh, Latin America was unable to because of the internal structure, the elite controls, the disintegration and so on, the subordination to the U.S. All of that is changing. Uh, they still are largely export economies, very fragile. Uh, but uh, they're not entirely linked to the U.S. economy any longer. Uh, the major exporters, uh, Brazil, uh, Argentina, Peru, Chile, Venezuela, of course, are diversifying both to Europe, but more significantly to China. Uh, China is also, uh, which is resource hungry, uh, so it's a very complementary relationship. And China is also beginning to invest in 
Latin America, the U.S. And like this a bit, but it is diversifying their options in the world. And as they integrate, they can move more successfully towards independence. They can no longer be picked up one at a time and destroyed just to some cooperation. Uh, the, there, it's, it's by no means an easy process. There are a lot of problems to be developed, and the U.S. is not sitting by quietly and watching it happen. Uh, the uh, uh, number of uh, U.S. military personnel in uh, Latin America has increased sharply. It's probably higher than it was during the Cold War uh, for the first time. It's never true in the Cold War. The number of military personnel, U.S. military personnel, is greater than the number of civilians in key federal agencies. Uh, the uh, training of Latin American officers has increased very sharply. Uh, the training has been shifted from the State Department to the Pentagon, which is of some significance. Uh, when it's under the control of the State Department, uh, theoretically at least, it's under some kind of congressional supervision for conditionalities, for human rights, and so on. The rules aren't applied very rigorously, but at least they're there, they have some effect. When it moves over to Pentagon training, it's no control at all under the Pentagon. Do anything you like. Uh, the mission of the Latin American officers has been shifted as well. Uh, they are now to combat what's called radical populism. Well, anyone who knows anything about Latin America understands the phrase. Uh, radical populism is a term that refers to uh, uh, human rights activists, uh, labor organizers, uh, uh, priests working with peasants, maybe reading the Gospels, uh, uh, anyone who's uh, challenging the authoritarian structures, that's radical populism. Uh, the, uh, and, just, and there are, there are several, not many, military bases in the region anymore. In fact, there's only one large mil U.S. military base uh, in uh, Ecuador. And right now, it's an open question whether the Ecuadorian government will permit it to remain. Uh, the Rafael Correa, was just elected, uh, was elected on a, a kind of a left, uh, what's called populist program. Uh, he, during his presidential campaign, he said that he would allow the base to remain open if the United States would permit an Ecuadorian military base to be established near Miami. Uh, his, his way of saying, we're not going to just let you put military bases in our country because you feel like it and you're bigger than we are. Uh, whether they'll implement that threat, I don't know. But if they dismantle it, it'll be the largest military base, maybe the only significant one in South America will be gone. There are other centers, Paraguay, Colombia, and so on. but. Uh, the measures of control are weakening, and the moves towards integration are continuing. This has led to a doctrinal shift in the United States. There's a new party line. Now you can read it in just about any journal. Uh, this month's uh, issue of current history, for example, foreign affairs. The new party line is, well, yes, uh, the continent, subcontinent is drifting to the left, but there are good leftists and bad leftists. We have to make a sharp distinction between them. Uh, the good leftists are uh, uh, Garcia in Peru and primarily Lula, Lula da Silva in Brazil. They're kind of moderate, good leftists, more or less do what we say. Uh, the bad leftists are, of course, Chavez, uh, Morales, uh, probably Correa. They haven't yet placed him into a niche yet. Uh, and uh, Bachelet and Chile is kind of in between, uh, Kirchner is probably a bad leftist, uh, the, uh, not as bad as, uh, as uh, Chavez, and that's roughly the party line. And in order to sustain, and recall, in the West it's necessary for party lines to be very sharp and simple so that intellectuals can repeat them, uh, press can repeat them, make it clear, you know, no ambiguity. Um, but in order to maintain the clarity of the party line, it has been able, it's been necessary to uh, uh, do some rather fancy footwork. So, for example, it is necessary to suppress, as far as I can tell, 100% in the United States, about the whole West, 
to suppress the fact that uh, when Lula was re-elected in October in Brazil, his first major act and first foreign trip uh, was to Venezuela, where he went to support Chavez in his uh, presidential campaign, and also to uh, dedicate a uh, joint Venezuelan-Brazilian project, a big bridge over the Orinoco River, and to initiate uh, other Venezuelan-Brazilian projects. Well, that doesn't fit the image. So the way you handle that is just got by some reporting. So I doubt if there's one person in a million in the United States who even knows it. Uh, it's also necessary to suppress the fact that uh, of the Cochabamba meeting, which I mentioned before, which took place just a few weeks later. It's a major meeting of South American leaders. We can't predict how far it'll go anymore than you could predict that early stages of the European Union, how far it would go, but it was clearly very significant. Uh, Cochabamba is a very important place. Cochabamba is the place where the, uh, uh, the peasant Indian struggles against neoliberalism focused. There was an attempt by the World Bank and the IMF to compel the neoliberal government of Bolivia to privatize water. And now you can call in the economists and I'll explain to you that if you get prices right, everything's more efficient and so on and so forth. And it works very nicely on the blackboard. Uh, but there's a small footnote which is ignored, uh, namely if you get the prices right in the technical sense, uh, many of the people can't pay them. So they die of uh, lack of water. Well, you know, everything can't work out perfectly. But the uh, uh, the Indian population didn't accept it. And there was an uprising, a bitter uprising. Dozens of people were killed. And they finally succeeded in driving uh, Bechtel, the major corporation, out of the country and terminating the program. Actually, that's a very interesting example of international solidarity, real globalization, authentic globalization, not the fraudulent kind that's talked about. The Cochabamba struggles uh, happened to be taking place, peaking right at the time of major demonstrations in Washington against the IMF and the World Bank. And with intelligent use of the internet, a little bit like the Zapatistas, the activists, some of the activists in Cochabamba were able to uh, organize, help stimulate demonstrations actually around the world at Bechtel headquarters, uh, also in, at the Washington meeting. And that gave publicity to another. Uh,